Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in five minutes or less. We begin today with an update in the AI data revolt. Over the last few weeks, we've seen the first coordinated labor movement that is at least in part about AI. It started with the Writers Guild of America, a union that represents TV, film, and entertainment writers. Now, there are many different parts of the dispute, but one of them is certainly a fear of being replaced by AI. The WGA had wanted to be able to negotiate about how AI could or couldn't be used in the writing and production of TV shows and films, and the entertainment industry on the other side basically initially at least said, nah. Right away, people understood that there was a significance for other types of jobs and employment, not just WGA writers. Polygon Peace on May 31st wrote, AI can't replace humans yet, but if the WGA writers don't win, it might not matter. The WGA strike is only the first battle in an oncoming labor war. Then, of course, last week, the Screen Actors Guild joined the fight. This is the first time that the Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild of America have been on strike at the same time since 1960. And again, while the issues are more numerous than just artificial intelligence, AI sits right at the center. Certainly, AI has been at the center of a lot of the discourse around this particular strike, given that last week, one of the statements made by studio executives said that SAG had rejected what they called a groundbreaking AI offer. Now, SAG, meanwhile, said that that groundbreaking offer involves scanning background actors with AI and being able to use their likeness in perpetuity without permission or payment, effectively relegating all background actors to getting one day of pay for the rest of their lives. Perhaps expectedly, studio executives hit back and said that wasn't exactly the case. But wherever the truth lies, the point is that at that point, you had SAG and the Writers Guild of America who were actively protesting against, in part, AI in the workplace. Today, a group of nearly 8,000 authors published an open letter asking Meta, OpenAI, Microsoft, and more to stop training their AI models on their works without permission or compensation. The signatories include a who's who of modern authors, including Nora Roberts, Margaret Atwood, and more. But in the same way that the SAG strike isn't really about the big actors and their destinies, and is instead about all the working actors and all the people in the industry who don't make bank from that work, the author's letter is also really about the average writer who has seen a significant decline in their income over the last decade. According to a report from the Authors Guild, the median income for a full-time writer last year was just $23,000. Between 2009 and 2019, writers' incomes declined by 42%. So, of course, the signatories' letter fear that this will further marginalize authors, and basically they ask for what? Alexander Chi, who's written best-selling novels like Edinburgh and The Queen of the Night, wrote, There's no urgent need for AI to write a novel. The only people who might need that are the people who object to paying writers what they're worth. Mary Rassenberger, the CEO of the Authors Guild, said, It's not fair to use our stuff in your AI without permission or payment. Please start compensating us and talking to us. Now, for those of you asking why not just sue, Rassenberger said lawsuits are a tremendous amount of money. They take a really long time. Because of that, the Authors Guild is trying this public pressure approach first. Of course, some other authors, including Sarah Silverman, have recently filed class action lawsuits against those companies for training AI on their works. And it appears that there may be more legal action coming from the publishing world, as IEC's Barry Diller says that he's planning on taking legal action against these companies around the exact issues, using published proprietary works and the training of AI. In an appearance on CBS's Face the Nation on Sunday, Diller said, It will be long-term catastrophic if there is not a business model that allows people professionally to produce content. That would be, I think everybody agrees, catastrophic. Diller went on saying, Of course, we're open to commercial agreements. The only way you get to the point is to protect fair use, protect the copyright. Comparing it to previous battles, he said, It took 15 years to get back paywalls that protected publishers. I don't think that same thing is going to happen. Now, Diller also did say that he thought that generative AI was overhyped. When asked about whether he thought it presented a real threat to these Hollywood jobs, he said, I think the one to three year period, not much is going to happen. But post that, there are, of course, all these issues. Next up on the brief, moving to the policy side of things for a moment, the UN Security Council is planning to hold its first ever talks on AI risks this week. The rotating presidency of the UN Security Council is currently held by Britain, and British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly will chair the discussion on Tuesday around how global nations could come together to mitigate the potential problems of AI. One of the big discussions is whether at some point there will need to be a global watchdog body like the International Atomic Energy Agency, and in June, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres had indicated his support for such a proposal. Speaking of risks in AI and global power issues, Bloomberg is reporting that the Israel Defense Forces have started using artificial intelligence extensively in their military operations. Currently, that includes selecting targets for airstrikes, organizing wartime logistics. And while the IDF isn't commenting too extensively on this, there's certainly no stranger to the use of AI in combat. 
In 2021, during the 11-day conflict in Gaza, the IDF dubbed it the first, quote, AI war. In that conflict, the IDF used artificial intelligence to both identify rocket launch pads as well as to deploy drone swarms. As Israel's tensions with Iran grow, many are wondering if we're about to see the first wider use of AI in kinetic combat. Now, our main show today is going to be exploring to what extent AI is in a bubble, and even more than that, to what extent that bubble is starting to, if not pop, at least show signs of strain. And so a teaser related to that, Stability AI CEO Iman Mostak last week appeared on an analyst call with UBS and said two seemingly contradictory things. On the one hand, he identified artificial intelligence as a $1 trillion investment opportunity, But on the other hand, he said it would be the biggest bubble of all time. He said, I call it the dot AI bubble, and it hasn't even started yet. Now, of course, the reason that these two statements are not necessarily at the odds they might initially seem is that the fact that you have such a massive, massive investment opportunity, of course, means that not everyone's going to get it right about what to invest in. Capital will inevitably chase the opportunity into places where it ultimately doesn't take root. And so for as much money as will be made on the opportunity, obviously, a lot of money will be lost as well. Meanwhile, in fundraising, it seems that money continues to flow to big AI startups. Despite the fact that they raised $150 million just four months ago, Character AI is back in talks to raise more. But that news might be tempered by the fact that it appears that a number of AI startups have actually had to do a round of layoffs. In today's main AI breakdown, we'll be looking at whether layoffs at Jasper and Mutiny actually reflect a larger trend, or whether they are more specific to those companies themselves. For now, that's going to do it for the AI Breakdown Brief. If you're enjoying it, go subscribe to the newsletter. It's at the AIbreakdown.beehive. That's B-E-E-H-I-I-V.com. And I'll be back soon with the main AI breakdown.